everyone. Welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I'm Dr. Meenakshi Mahesh, Fellow in Vitro Retina and Ocular Oncology. Let's review some of this month's interesting articles. The first article deals with supplementation with low-dose oral retinol and its benefit in improving retinal function in eyes with AMD, but without reticular pseudodrosin. Five patients with intermediate AMD were recruited for this study and supplemented with 16,000 international units of vitamin A palmitate for eight weeks, which was a lower dose as compared to that used previously. Rod intercept time improved significantly in the AMD group after four and eight weeks of vitamin A supplementation. With that adaptation, cone plateau also significantly improved, that is, more sensitive cone threshold at four and eight weeks. The other parameters, such as best corrected visual acuity and low luminance visual acuity, did not show significant improvement, though. The lack of improvement in the reticular pseudotrosin group may indicate structural impediments to increasing vitamin A availability in these patients and or may reflect the higher variability observed in the functional parameters for this group. Moving on to Article 2, the retinal artery angles in high axial myopia and its relationship with visual function. The cross-sectional study included 112 eyes with high axial myopia based on axial length the participants were divided into three groups in ascending order of axial length. Scanning laser ophthalmoscopy imaging was used to analyze the retinal arterial angle or the Yugami correlated angle or YCA. Retinal vascular densities in both superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus were evaluated. Fixation behavior, including retinal mean sensitivity, were analyzed by micropermetry. Finally, the correlation between YCA and axial length, the vascular densities, best corrected visual acuity, and fixation behavior were assessed. Smaller YCAs were correlated with longer axial length, lower vascular density in the superficial capillary plexus, decreased best corrected visual acuity, and reduced mean sensitivity. The YCAs might reflect vascular deformation caused by axial elongation and could potentially be useful in predicting visual functions in high axial myopia. Our next article is about OCD changes in hyperreflective foci in regmatogenous retinal detachment after successful surgery for the same. 29 macula of regmatogenous retinal detachment patients were analyzed. The relationship between hyperreflective foci and photoreceptor layer status, visual outcomes, were evaluated. After reattachment of the retina, hyperreflective foci were mainly distributed where external limiting membrane or ISOS was disrupted. In the outer retina, hyperreflective foci increased in the initial three months after retinal reattachment and then decreased gradually after three months. The hyperreflective foci number in the outer retina at postoperative 0.5 months was associated with favorable visual outcomes at 6 and 12 months. However, the hyperreflective foci number at 3 months was correlated with poor visual results at 6 and 12 months. Going forward, this article is regarding the effect of post-COVID-19 infection on retinal microvasculature. The study included 150 eyes, 50 eyes of controls, and 100 eyes of patients during the first month following COVID-19 recovery, as evidenced by two negative polymerase chain reactions, a complete ophthalmic examination and optical coherence tomography angiography were performed to detect the deep and superficial macular vessel density. In addition, the vessel density of the optic disc was evaluated. Deep vessel density showed a statistically significant decrease in post-COVID-19 patients, particularly those with severe COVID-19. This reduction occurred in the whole image, parafoveal and perifoveal vessel density. In the superficial vessel density, only the superior hemisphere of the whole image density was statistically significantly reduced. There was no statistically significant difference in foveal vessel density, both deep and superficial vessels. Regarding the foveal avascular zone, there was no significant difference among the groups. Regarding optic disc, the whole image vessel density 
and radial peripapillary capillary vessel density demonstrated a highly significant decrease, particularly in those with severe cases of COVID-19. Conversely, inside disc vessel density showed a non-significant change among the study groups. According to the findings of the current study, retinal microvasculature was affected in the first month following recovery from COVID-19. The deep vessel density was significantly reduced more than the superficial vessel density. In addition, peripapillary vessel density decreased, whereas the foveal avascular zone was unaffected. Moving ahead to Article 5, thinner inner retinal layers are associated with lower cognitive performance, lower brain volume, and altered white matter network, the Maastricht study. They proposed that the retina may provide non-invasive scalable biomarkers for monitoring cerebral neurodegeneration. This group evaluated associations of retinal nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, and inner plexiform layer thickness with cognitive performance and magnetic resonance imaging indices, which included global gray and white matter volume, hippocampal volume, whole brain load degree, global efficiency, clustering coefficient, and local efficiency. It was found that the lower thickness of most inner retinal layers was significantly associated with worse cognitive performance, lower gray and white matter volume, lower hippocampal volume, and worse brain white matter network structure assessed from lower whole brain node degree, lower global efficiency, higher clustering coefficient, and higher local efficiency. The last interesting article is based on retinal optical coherence tomography features associated with incident and prevalent Parkinson's disease. They investigated inner retinal anatomy measured using optical coherence tomography in prevalent Parkinson's disease and subsequently assessed the association of these markers with the probable development of Parkinson's disease using a prospective research cohort. For the detection of retinal markers in prevalent Parkinson's disease from Alzheimer's, a retrospective cohort of almost 154,000 participants aged 40 years and over attending secondary care of Thalvik hospitals in London, UK between 2008 and 2018 were used. For the evaluation of retinal markers in incident Parkinson's disease, they used data from UK Biobank, a prospective population-based cohort where 67,000 volunteers aged 40 to 69 years were recruited between 2006 and 2010 and underwent retinal imaging. The macular retinal nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell inner plexiform layer, and the inner nuclear layer thickness were extracted from fovea-centered OCT. Linear mixed effects models were fitted to examine the association between the prevalent Parkinson's disease and retinal thickness. Hazard ratios for the association between time to Parkinson's disease diagnosis and retinal thickness were estimated using frailty models. Within the Alzheimer's cohort, there were 700 individuals with prevalent Parkinson's disease and about 1,5,000 controls. Individuals with prevalent Parkinson's disease had thinner ganglion cell inner plexiform layer and inner nuclear layer. The UK Biobank included 50,000 participants, of whom 53 developed Parkinson's disease at a mean of 2,653 plus or minus 850 days. Thinner ganglion cell inner plexiform layer and thinner inner nuclear layer were also associated with incident Parkinson's disease. Thus, individuals with Parkinson's disease have reduced thickness of the inner nuclear layer and the ganglion cell inner plexiform layer of the retina. Involvement of these layers several years before clinical presentation highlight a potential role for retinal imaging for at-risk stratification of Parkinson's disease. That brings us to the end of this month's Retina Roundup. We will see you next month with some more interesting articles. Thank you.